So let's move welcome on, former top 100 recruit, four star, now the newest member of GW, Joe Bannister. How you doing, man? I'm good. How are you, bro? Pretty good. Well, it's not. He got third interview now. We've talked for almost every year for the past three years, and a lot of stuff has happened in each chapter now, but this next one is heading out to GW, A10. How excited are you feeling right now? I'm super excited. Uh, I'm excited to get to D.C. and uh, play for Coach Christian and play with the guys on the team that are also coming in with me. I think we'll have a great year. We're really going to get heavy into this transfer a little bit more on the end, but I do want fans to get to know you a little better. So let's kind of go through your story, your journey to this point. You're obviously from Virginia. You grew up out there. Kind of get to that. What was like growing up out there? Um, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's home. Um, mm -hmm. There's so much to do, obviously. You know, there's like a city, there's suburban areas. Uh, like, I, I don't know, like I'm really into museums and stuff. So going to museums is pretty cool. And then I was always a gym rat, and even to this day, I'm a gym rat. So a lot of my time being in Richmond was just spent being in the gym. And outside of that, just doing other stuff I like to enjoy at home. I'm a, I'm a homebody, so finding hobbies and things that allow me to be creative are things that I engage in at home. Let's dive into that other side of you, because as we know, you're a great player. You're going to bring a lot to GW. You've brought a lot to a lot of teams you've been on so far, but... There's a whole other side of you. You're not just a guy that's always just about basketball. You have a lot of cool stuff you work on off the court. You work on music. You're painting now. You do all kinds of different stuff. Walk us to the other side of Joe Bamso. Um, So I think I have, like, a pretty creative brain, you know. Um, and I, li I like to express. I think basketball is probably my greatest form of expression in a way, like, it is just a form and not the only form. And I got heavily into making music and writing poetry and painting and all those things in a way are, they allow me to kind of show others what is going on in my mind without necessarily like telling it to them, which I really like. Um, and the same way with basketball, like being able to kind of express how, I'm, how I am, what I'm doing on the court, you know what I'm saying? I'll just a little bit deeper about each one of those aspects to you. We start off with music. When did that first start becoming something that you enjoyed doing and really became a hobby of yours? When I was 12, I started making beats. Like, um, actually, before then, so my mom had this guitar that she used to, that I used to play. So I was playing guitar for like seven, eight, nine years old. Then I stopped. And then we had a piano in our house. So I was playing piano for as long as I can remember. But then I just got super uninterested in like, actually playing instruments and I just wanted to be able to make like legit full songs um and I kind of took it step by step so I started making beats and then at around 12 and then at about like 14 or 15 I started trying to like rap but then I realized I wasn't a rapper so I started singing around 16 and then around 17 my mom like low-key forced me to release music because she was like you have so many songs if no one ever hears them you'll never uh show your talent and i was like you're right so i started releasing them and now i still make music almost every day in some form or fashion and i think improving at that is a very good way for me to just i don't know have a therapeutic time for myself you know what i mean and you're not the only player that does that. We know there's many guys that yeah, work on music. Some are rap artists. Like we see Damian Lillard, Marvin Bagley. The list goes on different athletes that are working on music too. But how important is that for someone? For you, or how have you kind of seen that benefit you not only having to focus always on basketball and kind of have another outlet, another place to go kind of express your feelings and kind of take your mind off of basketball at times? Um, I would definitely say, like, basketball-wise, like, you can – show your skill set and then have like a vibrancy to what you do on the court that might demonstrate a piece of yourself but i think music especially making the beats and, and everything i really get to express how i feel you know through creating a mood or creating a certain dynamic that i want listeners to get from my music and also from a lyrical perspective like getting people to feel what i'm feeling like through words I think it's important and having the ability to do that, um, I think is, like I said earlier, it's been very therapeutic and um, helps get things off my mind sometimes, helps me to think things through, you know, from an alternate perspective. So 
yeah, I would say it's super important. And I think any, anyone should find the time to be creative in that regard to express themselves verbally or even musically, just to get the mood out of yourself and to others. Out of all the songs you have made up to this point in time, what would you say has been your favorite one? Favorite one is one releasing in two weeks. It's called Fly Wavy. Um, I think it'll be a really good song. I think uh, a lot of people will like it. And it's yet to be heard, but it'll be heard very soon. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Well, you also just mentioned before we started this that you also get into painting as well now. Walk us through that and how you fell in love with that. Okay, so like kind of similar to music. Like one thing about music I really love that's not like anything else. When you're creating music, you can just stop whenever you want and you can come back to it. You can have new inspiration. You can have like new ideas. And so like randomly, I'm a pretty, I wouldn't call myself spontaneous, but like I'm very much so like if something comes to mind, I'm like, all right, I'll try it. So I uh, did exactly that. I went to Michael's. I, I purchased some watercolors and a paintbrush and started painting. I think I have some in my car. I can actually, yeah, got a couple I'll show. They're like small little things that I pick up like anytime I feel like doing it. And they're like, yeah, like they're just, can you see that well or not? Nah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's awesome. And from every angle, it's like a, it, its own thing. Um, yeah, that's the best example I have in the car. I have another like small one. Um, but yeah, they're all just different. Um, they take no direction. I kind of just let, I just let my mind see what the paintbrush is doing and go from there. I don't have any direction when I start. Is there a favorite painting you've had so far? Favorite painting? Mm. Probably that's one that's undone. Um, I can show that to you as well. I wasn't gonna show it just because it wasn't done, but. Uh, this right here, it's uh, really interesting. It's like a, I don't know, everything is coming from this one guy's brain. But then if you flip it upside down, it's more than just the guy. It's like those things thinking about him as well. And I kind of thought it was like cool to hang out because like our minds are so diverse. But if you think about it, like there's so much going on in our minds. But yeah, yeah, let me not get too philosophical, but yeah. <laughs> now, you kind of expand, expand on that a little bit because knowing you now, I know that obviously you are much more than just a player we already discussed, but you do think about things a lot more than people do. You have a really more brilliant mind to say than most people do, especially in the athletic world. How have you learned to like kind of embrace that? Because especially being your age, balancing just the high school life, now college life, and now embracing just all the stuff that comes with the game of basketball and school. How have you learned to find time to kind of embrace all the other aspects to you and understand all the other aspects of life? Um, I think, you know, like I said earlier, I'm a homebody, right? So I'm not crazy into like going out or anything. I'm not crazy into playing video games. Like I have my friends and the people I love um, and family that I spend time with. But um, I think when you are when you embrace being alone or having solitude in a way, you can find things that bring you enjoyment. And I don't know, all these things, even though they all revolve around creativity, they bring me a sense of enjoyment. And I, I like, one thing I like about all of them is like, I can pick it up and put it down whenever I want. And I can create my own meaning within them. And I just find that so valuable. Like, I think we, we live a life where like we're told what things mean and I really like these things because I get to enact that meaning myself. When you're in a locker room last year, especially when you kind of talk about that with Virginia Tech, did those guys, were they all aware of your paintings? Were they aware of your music? Like how, and how did they kind of embrace it? Did anyone, did it for music aspect, did any of them ever hop on a song with you or have Anderson hopping on a song with you? Um, my teammates are super supportive of being creative because like, I think it's just a stigma that athletes are just athletes. Like, everyone in my locker room, they had all their own interests outside of basketball. So, you know, being able to be respectful of what guys like is important. And some guys like doing <laughs> tons of different stuff, but they were just super supportive of the stuff I liked. And they uh, 
they like they like my music. I appreciated it and um even saw some listening at times. I was like, yeah, my boy, my boy. Like even when I released my album, a lot of my teammates uh they helped post it and send it around to people. So I was like, cool, I like, appreciate y'all. Were there any other artists in that locker room? Was there anyone else that tried working on music or even tried hopping on a song with you at any point? Um, there's this one dude named Jonathan Cabango. We never made a song, but we talked a lot about music, like pretty weekly. Um, just diving into a lot of different stuff. He's more on the rap end. I'm more on like a singing indie pop end. But there's always somewhere in the middle to meet when it comes to music because it's such a diverse unique thing and we would talk a lot about stuff and never in terms of all right let's make a song but we'd send each other our music give each other feedback things like that so yeah absolutely well, let's kind of get back into your whole basketball career a little bit because obviously you had a great career out there in virginia you moved around quite a bit you had a lot of different stories and opportunities you had that came up through high school we started off originally at st christopher's in eighth grade when you first started playing high school being in that system what was that like at such a young age, kind of getting involved in the high school world that early on? It gave me a lot of confidence. I was like, yo, I'm tough. <laughs> and uh, I'd say that's the biggest thing. I think being in the eighth grade was the first time I realized, like, yo, I have a really good chance to be a pretty good basketball player if I just stick to it. And, um, yeah, that's what I did. And I learned a lot from the older guys. Like, it's one thing I've always tried to do everywhere I've gone, like, soak in what I can from older people and – take things I can learn from going forward and add that to my own life or my own game, whichever, whichever it was. And when you look at overall, like going in eighth grade, that's something that's not easy for a lot of guys because you start getting, getting a lot of attention on you. People start realizing, all right, he's something special. He can be a great player. He's probably going to be a division one player. I think the first offer came in around freshman year at that time. How are you able to get that much confidence and that much attention on you? Still be able to pan out, still become a great player and withstand that thought of four or five year span. That's not easy for a lot of guys. Um, I'm a daily guy, so I don't think attention or lows and highs don't really bother me. Like, as long as I know I'm getting in the gym, I'm getting better, and I can check that off the box for the day, it's like whatever happens, I'm going to just keep trying my best. And for me, that's why I think I'm at such peace with life in a way. Like, I'm obviously not – you know, in the NBA right now, but, you know, one day at a time has always been my mission. And I think that's done a lot good for me. Then you hop into your freshman season and now you're actually in high school, but for you, it is your second year of high school basketball. What was that year like? You guys didn't go in 2011, but walk us that year a little bit. Um, I started the year off like kind of not playing you know, kind of didn't want special treatment to the freshman. And then I started playing. I was hooping. I was getting bucks. And then I went from off the bench to starting. And when I started starting, I was averaging like 10, 11 points. And then the last four or five games this season, I had anywhere between like 18 and 25, like a few times. So that gave me even more confidence. Like, wow, like I'm 14, really killing folks. And then, um, yeah, that was that. Was that. You then get an opportunity that comes across your table, and that is to go to Mount Vernon. We already know how special they are. They're one of, not the best, prep organizations and programs you could possibly attend to go to. You never transfer out there and then for your sophomore year. Walk us through, like, how did that opportunity come to you? Like, how did it all get set up for you? My uh, trainer knows, is friends with one of the coaches there, and they uh, – got in contact with each other and saw how well I was doing and had a conversation with my parents and it just worked out that I could go there my sophomore year. Um, unfortunately, I obviously didn't get to play because I got injured, but I still learned a lot basketball wise. And I think that's just the most important thing. Like that year was a big year of learning and big year of just getting better mentally at basketball. That's special, too, because, as you said, injuries are something that obviously no player wants to go through. You want to be on the court playing. But as you said, there is time where you can learn stuff. You can improve your IQ of the game. You can learn to better yourself on the court, kind of get a coaching aspect to a degree. How much does that help you? Because that wasn't your only big injury. Yeah. missed your senior year down the road, too. But how, when you have an injury, do you take advantage of that and kind of learn other parts of your game? How do I help benefit that? So one thing I do, like I've been injured a couple of times, obviously. 
One thing I do is when I first get injured, I just completely take my mind off basketball. I can just get into the other things I like to do. And why I do that is because I think it is important to miss basketball sometimes. And if I were to take a break from basketball, like mentally, and never get to a point where I missed basketball, I would know whether I enjoyed basketball as much as I'm saying or not. And because every time it's like there is like a, a miss and a yearning to get back to it, one, I knew it was something I want to get back to. And two, I would come back with more energy to be a better player. And unfortunately, when you get injured, it's not usually physically. So that means mentally you have to get better. And seeing the game differently, knowing what you can bring to the table when you do get back healthy and sharpening up little skills you might not work on if you were a thousand percent athletic, you get to add those things to your game. So I did a lot of that kind of stuff to my game sophomore year, um, which prepared me better for my junior year. And there's not really a locker room you could have been in that year. Obviously, there wasn't a locker room you could have been in better that year in terms of learning from players because you guys were the best of the best. Geico National Champions, incredible season out there. And you're learning from a guy R.J. Barrett, the future of New York Knicks, a top number one player in the country at that time. Andrew Nemhard, a guy that just played in the National Championship. The Mitchell Twins, I've had a great career so far. DeVoe is obviously playing exceptional out there at Georgia Tech. Like, this list goes on and on of guys that have been successful at the next level, too. How are you able to learn from those guys and how do they help better you as a player? I, I learned that year how you – this thing called pace, right? I never uh, really thought about it, but all those guys, especially Mike and Andrew, they had so much pace to their game. Like, there was never – they never played faster than they wanted to. And at the time, being like a 16, 15, 16-year-old, like, who depends on athleticism to play their game, I never had to – use pace um so i learned that from them and then rj he's an interesting dude but i learned a lot from him in terms of um doing what you do really really well and i'm obviously not trying to take anything away from his game but even if you watch him now in the league him going left is not getting stopped you know what i'm saying like he is super efficient at doing the things he does and he does them at an extremely high level. And I think learning those two things, um, pace and doing what you do well, well, it was a lot um, to take away in one year. You first started mentioning off that saying that RJ was a little bit of a weird dude. Explain that a little bit. Like, what were some funny things about him? Uh, he's just interesting. Um, he, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but if you've ever been friends with RJ, you would, you would uh, think he's interesting as well. <laughs> it's as deep as that goes. <laughs> now, you're kind of walking around with these guys, and obviously they, all these guys are in high school. They're not exactly who they are today. But what were some of the funniest moments you remember? Like, what were the funniest things you took away from that season, rather than being in the locker room, on practice, off the court? Like, what were some of the funny stories you have from that team? I mean, a couple of these stories I, I don't think I should share, but um, off the court, maybe. I had government class with uh, Andrew. And Andrew might be, like, one of the funniest people you might ever meet. Like, he's just a really good storyteller. So um, every single day, I would just go in, and we would talk about something random, and then we would just start laughing. I don't know. It's very, like, nothing crazy, but... It was just funny. And then the next semester, my government block switched to a class called World History. And Mike Duvo was in that class instead of Andrew now. So it was like the same thing. Like I walk in and I was obviously picking their brains basketball wise, but it was really cool to just like get to know them like one on one as people and uh, actually have a bond with them in that kind of way. And I don't think I have necessarily any like specific stories like like I don't know, we didn't like rob a bank or anything together, but the little things like sitting in class and like making jokes about stuff every single day, like something that I always remember. Everyone always talks about mentality and each guy that's an elite player has a mentality, but we know the guys that end up making, the guys that become NBA players, that's a different kind of breed that you guys have in the mentality. So you're around a guy in RJ who is obviously a bona fide player, is the future of the New York Knicks, a guy like Michael DeVoe, who I think will be pro eventually, rather it be this year or the following 
Nam Hart obviously has a chance of doing that. There's a bunch of guys that have that pro mentality about them. How did you learn from them in that aspect, and what does it exa- exactly look like? Everyone's different. Um, like, I think if you were to take two, for example, like two famous artists or two famous doctors, like I'm sure there are intertwining qualities, but everyone has to do what was right for them. So, like, for RJ, I know for him, it was like working up, like getting up a lot of shots. Whereas for like Andrew, when I used to watch him work out, it was getting up a lot, like getting in the lane, working on floaters. And he legit used to be in workouts, passing the ball. Until this day, I don't do that. Like I'm shooting the ball every time when I'm working out. So it's cool to see how different people tend to different needs for what they need in their game. Um, I would say one thing that I saw across all those guys, is that there is a level of consistency, you know, in being in the gym. But in terms of what, they're actually working on every player just needs to decide what what the, for themselves like what they need to work on what's been like watching rj go through his college career and then nba and all these guys kind of follow their careers like what's like knowing that hey i play with those guys i know them i'm cool with them how's it just been like kind of watching their careers unfold um for me that's one reason why i'm super excited to go to gw like i think when i get the chance to to play i know how much talent and uh how good I am at basketball. And I think once I get to show that, knowing I was competing with those guys pretty well at a young age, I know now, like, when I get the chance to show what I can do, I'm definitely going to be able to put myself in a position to do similar things to what those guys are doing. Absolutely. Well, then you make the decision to come back home. You come back to Virginia after that season, and you go and have the best high school season by far out there at Monacan. Walk into that decision. Why is that the school you end up going to? So after I got hurt that time, um, I was just like, I enjoy playing basketball. I don't care where that is. I just want to play basketball. And I want to, I was obviously wanted to do different things outside of basketball. So I literally just moved back into my first house I ever lived in here in Virginia. And my parents were like, all right, we should, we want to put you in a private school. And I was like, nah, I'm just going to go to the public school down the street. And they're like, what? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, all right, bet. Um, and that's exactly what happened. Like, as a, as a junior, I had no, like, me wanting to go, like, super high major wasn't a thought process. It was literally just, like, I'm going to play basketball, and whatever happens, happens. And I think playing basketball, like, that for me, like, being able to have mental freedom from – pressure and stress like makes me play better you know and like in a way like this is me going from Montverde to Monacan is very similar as right now me going from Tech to GW. Mm-hmm. And that's an interesting thing because as you said you at that point just wanted to play Division One in some capacity but you really just wanted to play basketball because you love the game but when for you would you say kind of settled in like when did you start saying okay I'm, I think I'm going to be an elite player. I'm a guy that can be a top 100 recruit. I can be a guy that should be able to play at any Division One school I really want to. Like, I'm at that elite kind of level now. Um, I went to the top 100 camp, right? Mm-hmm. And when I went there, people were like, oh, like, oh, you've just been playing against, you know, like white kids at Monica. You're not that good. And I was like, okay, like. I made it here, though, so I have to be kind of good, you know what I'm saying? So I started hooping in the, in the camp, and I ended up finishing, like, in the top ten of the entire camp. And there's dudes from all over the country and people in different um, states there who are supposed to be top guys. And by the end of the camp, I was like, wow, that was that was really easy. That was not hard. I figured that I have to be on uh, some level, you know, in, comparable to other top guys. And, um, and yeah, I just had a good sense of confidence and how good I was and what I was doing. So, yeah. That's a camp that is one of the more prestigious camps. And there's a lot of reasons between that because obviously this past year with COVID, it wasn't able to happen. And people obviously don't know exactly who the top guys are. Not a lot of guys are playing. But when you talk about that environment, you're taking the guys that are known as, quote, unquote, the best players in the country, the top 100. So they're probably a little bit more than 100. But all those guys kind of come into a room and you truly just battle it out. You see who truly is the best because obviously the best guys will rise up and perform the best. 
how critical is that game and that kind of situation and environment for guys to really kind of level out and see where you rank up against other players? I mean, it's great. Um, I think in an environment like that, though, like one thing I learned is you have to have no self-doubt. Like I think a lot of players at any level, it's not that they necessarily doubt their game, but while they're playing, they might think. And I think you have to have no self-doubt. Mm-hmm. And to do that, you also kind of need to be in a situation where the coach has a lot of belief in you, you know. And I think for me, like I, from then on, I've had no self-doubt in my game with wherever I've been or whatever I'm doing. So I've uh, continued that now and seen a lot of benefits from it. At the end of the day, as long as you're doing what you need to do confidently and it's productive, it, no one can say anything to you. That's a lot easier to say than do because we know that for someone to be able to go out there and go through ups and downs of basketball, play, it's not always going to be a perfect game. We all know that's not something you can't go 100% shooting. You're going to have off nights or whatnot. How do you always keep your confidence high? Though? How do you always keep your mindset high and not allow yourself to doubt yourself? Or like, What does it take for that mentality to get into you and what does that look like? Um. You know, you have to be super uh, – got to be in the gym, you know. That's that's it. Like, that's what it is for me. Um, like, I know I get up X amount of shots. I know I work on my game X amount of days of the week. So then it's like when I'm actually playing, like, even if someone else thinks something's a bad shot or that I should have done something else, it's like, no, like, I, I work on this. You know what I'm saying? So I never question things about myself or my game, about what I should be doing, because I, I know that. You know what I'm saying? Yep. It's like same, same with taking a test. Like, you know those smart people who go through tests and do super well? It's not that some people are more naturally smart, but they just have confidence from being prepared. I agree more. And after that season, your breakout year, and you have 29 points per game, seven rebounds, two assists, two steals, really emerge as a top 100 type of guy. When then you make a decision, their recruiting starts narrowing down for you. And come April, you decide to commit to Northwestern originally. What was that decision? Why is it the school you originally chose to go to? Um, I, I had a really good uh, official visit to Northwestern, like really good. Um, and I would say, I prematurely made a decision without – like, that was the only official visit I ever took. I prematurely made a decision without just deciding or factoring in other places. Mm. That's what I chose there. I know there's also a connection there. You know Robbie pretty well. He's still there, obviously. But what kind of factor did that have on there? And what would it have been like to possibly play with him and reunite with someone that you're pretty close with? Um, yeah, so – I love Robbie. And I wish I, at some point in the future, I hope we do get a chance to play together. But I think, uh, I don't know. Like, honestly, I don't even know how to answer that question. <laughs> like, it would have been cool, but at the end of the day, we both have our own kind of careers to worry about. So I never really, like, put it that much into consideration when choosing to not go to Northwestern anymore. This all kind of goes crazy because you commit in April, they said, you decommit July, and at that same time, then you also go and commit to Virginia Tech. What happened to that change? Like, how did that all happen? What really led to that change? So, uh, again, after the top 100 camp, I kind of knew I was in a good position to go play in the ACC. And playing in the ACC is something I've always wanted to do. So... You know, it was closer to home, which I wanted to give my parents a chance to still watch me play after all the sacrifices they've made for me in my life. Um, And Virginia Tech was that place. Um, Communicated with Coach Young and Webby. And at the time, it sounded like a really good place I'd fit into. And went on an official there. It went really well. And, yeah, that's that's all that was. That obviously led to your senior year then, and then you end up having to miss that year again. You have a little minor knee procedure that knocks you out for the senior year. How did that all go down and just walk us through that injury? Um, yeah, that injury wasn't that bad. It was simply me trying to um, just be prepared for college physically. And I knew that I would be 
if I played high school as a senior, I knew a thousand percent I'd probably average like 35. And I was more concerned about, at the time, being prepared for playing college basketball physically and mentally than I was, um, what's it called? Uh, than I was about, I don't know, gloating against other kids. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't really see what I would get out of playing my senior year, knowing that I could just fix what's wrong with me or what was bothering me. And then getting the time to put myself on a college schedule. Like I was, I was taking online classes as a senior. So I, I had like similar lifting times every single day and had a workout schedule with my basketball trainer every single day. I just thought that was much more impactful for me long-term and rightfully so when I got to college, like mentally I was completely ready to go. Like in terms of all the things we had to do school wise, basketball wise and lift wise obligationally, I was ready to go with that kind of stuff. And on the court and practice pretty almost every day I was doing really well. So I'm a, I would not go back in time and change that. When you did ultimately choose Virginia Tech as, you, as a school you were going to go to, was there a number two option? Like, was there someone else that you were really still loving or you really wanted to possibly look at if Virginia Tech wasn't an option? Like, was there a number two pick for you? Um, honestly, NC State. Okay. Yeah. NC State would have been the second option. And then after NC State would have been VCU. And then um, West Virginia was also in that list of people I would have called if Coach Young was like, nah. Mm-hmm. So clearly your biggest goal is to stay close to home. I know you mentioned your family, kind of a homebody earlier. And this GW is not obviously exactly at home, but it's pretty it's pretty relevant. Your family can still come watch you enough. How important though is it to you to stay to a college somewhere near home so that you can kind of still be around your family and be embraced by family? So back then it was super important. Right now, DC just happens to be where I think happens to be the best basketball fit. Like okay. if, if, if Coach Christian was coaching at – like in a school in California, I would go play in California. Um, I just think this is the best basketball decision I can make. Something I know is challenging for some guys, because especially seniors, juniors, whenever you go into that process, a couple of things, guys, that automatically come to mind is maybe I want to stay close to home and I don't want to look at other schools further away from home. Or another one is I want to go to the high major. I want to go to the biggest offer I have. I want to go there. That's kind of my dream. But if you look now, look at GWF, obviously isn't quote unquote a power six school or whatnot. They're still a great mid major school, pretty much almost a high major. But how important is it to you find the best fit as opposed to overall images looking and overall just a preference? It's in, it's incredibly hard because when you're a senior, junior, you're not watching a college basketball game and asking yourself, does the way they play fit my style of play? Yeah. You're not asking yourself like is this coach a player's coach or is he a coach's coach? You're not asking yourself anything like that. And I, you're not, you're not looking down the roster and thinking how many sophomores or freshmen do they have on the team that next year will be juniors and, and, and sophomores when I get there. Like I didn't think of any of that when I was a, um, a senior or a junior in high school, I was primarily thinking of what coaches do I connect with and, what atmosphere feels the best in terms of being at the actual school. And you, know, you kind of have this unquestioning self-belief that like, okay, no matter where I go, I'll be good enough to show that I'm the best, which is just not always the case, unfortunately, depending on who's your coach and what kinds of players are already there. So like making this decision was 10 times more easy than um, making a decision when I was a senior. Because now when a school called me, I could ask all those questions and find things out myself. And by the end of the call, I knew like, all right, I'm not going there. You know what I'm saying? Whereas like in high school, it's like every call was like, ooh, I can see myself there. You know what I'm saying? So let's kind of walk through this year now. You go into your freshman season and you haven't got experience of true college season when there's fans without the code restrictions. So you didn't necessarily have the hard adjustment in terms of that. We're used to something else and it changes for you, but nothing less. It still was a challenging, difficult year. You were in, your mask on stop, waking up early, get your COVID test each day, all the restrictions in the locker room, like all that stuff's going on for you still. 
what was this year like in terms of COVID? How did it impact you? What was this COVID season like for you? So since I'm a freshman and this is the only year of college basketball I've played, I like can't compare it to like a year of no restrictions. So for me, that's just college basketball. Like, unfortunately, like getting something up your nose frequently isn't the best. But outside of that, like, I wouldn't, I have nothing to compare it to. So I can't ask to replace this season. You know what I mean? Like, I enjoyed every every second of the season. Now, I do know you guys were affected pretty harshly by that. You guys were having an incredible season. Could have probably been a more top five looking seed for a little bit there. And really, we were looking special on a great run. Then COVID hit you guys. One of the harder times, they had the longest extension time out. I think it was 17 days or so. You guys missed a bunch of games. Obviously, it affects you guys in tournaments. How does it affect you the team? Because we all know it's too difficult. You take any time off in basketball midseason, getting all the chemistry back, getting back in shape is not easy. How do you see that affect the team as a whole during when you guys had to deal with the whole pandemic? It was weird um, because it was like a lot of guys were out when we first hit the pandemic. So I was playing a lot before this point because guys were out. And then guys started coming back. We played two games and I started playing like a little bit. And then another COVID thing hit. And then by the time we came back again, like I wasn't playing at all. So from like a individual standpoint, the COVID hits were like really weird for me because there was no like sustainability with my role. And then from a team aspect, it's like, it's crushing to go from like winning a game to, all right, you can't even participate in anything for a couple of days. And then you can't play in a game for a couple of weeks. You know, like you obviously still stay energized, but there's something about playing in a game that's completely different than practicing. And you can't, you can try your best to replicate it, but it's just not the same. I've heard a lot of funny stories, though, because we know this was difficult. Was, in a way, you just had to enjoy yourself to a degree because you weren't really able to go with family nonstop. Like, we know all the stuff that had to go on, but what were some of your funny stories, funny experiences from the whole COVID year that you have? Um, there's this one lady who did my COVID test where I, I don't know if she was doing it to other people, but I promise you, I think she was trying to, like, pull my brain out from from my nose. Like, she would literally violate me. And we all used to like, if she was there that day, we would text in the group chat, like, don't go to lane three or something. You know what I'm saying? And it was, it was pretty funny because she was always in lane three. I made sure never go to lane three. She got me, she got me twice though. There was this one time I walked in and there was no one else open and she said, I can help you. And I was just like, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that happened. As you mentioned, you start off the year, you got a lot of minutes earlier on. You're able to kind of get some playing time. But how are you able to kind of get established? Because anytime as a freshman, it's not easy getting used to the college world. But how do you feel you start getting kind of more comfortable in college throughout the year? Um, so I went into games initially, like, kind of timid because I was trying to, at this point, like, fit into a system, which made me play worse. And then by the last couple of games before ACC play started, I had – like nine points in like 10 minutes. And then the next game I had like 11 points in five minutes. So I was like, wow, I'm, I'm not playing good. And then I didn't play for eight straight games. And I was confused. I was like, wait, what? And I went and talked to my coach. He said, you're doing everything all right. Just keep doing what you're doing and continued on. And then on game number nine, um, one of our players unfortunately got suspended. So I played like six or seven minutes against Notre Dame. It was weird. And then against Pittsburgh, I barely played, but I got in for like three minutes. And then on that day, someone got – and then we played Miami. And I, again, I didn't even think I was going to play. I was almost too relaxed. I was chilling on the bench. And one of our players goes down, and I'm at legit in the middle of a conversation with one of my teammates – you know, like during the game on the bench, you talk to people. So I'm legit in the middle of a conversation. And in the, like out of the right, out of my right ear, I hear Joe. And I wasn't thinking anything of it. And my coach, like, he's like, Joe. And I turned, I'm like, what? <laughs> and he's like, get in the game. And I was like, oh man, took my warm up off, got in the game. And then 
Um, I had a pretty good game. I had, um, I think, like 11 or something, like 20 or so minutes. But um, it was the most I played in consecutive minutes. And since I knew, like, I had no one to sub me out just because we had so many guys out, I was just like, all right, I'm going to play my game. And then right after that, we hit the COVID pandemic. And I didn't, unfortunately, I didn't get to play until two weeks later against Wake Forest. And in that game, actually, no, we played Georgia Tech and I only played a couple of minutes. Um, and then the next game we played Wake Forest and I did really well in that game as well. And then another COVID pandemic hit and then we came back and played UNC. And against UNC, I played like four minutes or something and then went back home and we saw we were going to play Florida and then I didn't get to play against Florida. But yeah, for me, like this entire year, practice was like March Madness for me. Like I was going stupid hard in practice every single day. And I think if that's the one thing I got to, well, there's obviously a ton of other things I got to take away. But if that's a thing I got to take away from this year, that's I think a great thing to take away, like how important just going hard in practice is. And I hope to bring that to GW when I get there, like a good culture of practicing. This is something that I haven't ever heard a player do so far. And you played in 13 games this past year. I think you just walked through every single one of them in order against the team. We're going to touch up on some of those games originally, but how are you able to do it? Like you look through and just memorize each game, just about how many minutes you played, what you scored. How are you able to kind of memorize basically your entire freshman season? Um, I don't know, like <laughs> nothing, all of those games and stuff feel like a, like a long time ago, but like, um, like, I guess I, I write in a book every single day, like I journal every single day. Okay. So it, it's nothing for me to like recall past events sometimes, because I actually take the time to reflect on most days. So um, that makes it really easy to reflect on a day I've already reflected about, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You guys have a special team as well, and there's some guys in that roster I want to touch up on a little bit, one of which obviously is your main guy this past year. He led you guys in Kev A throughout the entire course of the year. Incredible player. I think he's going to go up for player of the year next year. What was it like just learning from him, and how special was he? Uh, honestly, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I would say – like, I'm not not close with Keve, but, mm -hmm. like, I've never been in the gym with him, like, working out except a couple of times to get him shot. So I never really got to see that specifically. Mm -hmm. um, like, we just individually doing our own thing. We never cross paths. But, like, on the court, like, in practice, he's a, he's a really uh, – he's a competitor. Like, in practice, he wants to win everything, no matter what drill it is, whether it's a three-on-three, three, a five-on-five, one-on-one, like, whether it's a defensive drill or get up shots, like he, he gets like le legitimately angry if he doesn't win. So I think it was really cool to see how much he just loves winning. Um, like a lot of, even if, even if he was playing three on three and that meant setting a bunch of screens, as long as his team won, he never complained about him being the leading scorer or, you know, him wanting to impact more. Like, like obviously there are times where he had to step up and, you know, be, the main offensive guy, but and I thought it was really cool to always see how that came from a place of wanting to win and not from a place of like selfishness. But um, outside of that though, like he's a really humble dude. Um, like you never see him gloating about himself or things like that. And I know whenever anyone else did well, he was the first to repost it or say something about it on social media. So yeah, he, he's in, in terms of that kind of stuff, he's cool. But in terms of like one-on-one -on -one things I've learned from him and like like the weight room or on the court, like unfortunately just with the way our schedules work, we didn't really get to always see each other mm -hmm. doing individual things, if that makes sense. Gotcha. I got to give you props on one thing, too, because watching a lot of Virginia Tech games, one thing you realize about yourself is clearly, I mean, it wasn't the ideal situation. You would have rather been playing a lot more minutes than a heavy rotational piece for the team. But 
every single game, you still kept your mindset high. You still kept continue to be a positive energy on the bench. You always were dancing, always were celebrating, having fun, even though probably in the inside your mind, probably like, okay, this is, I'd rather be in the game right now, but you never really showed that. You always show that you're excited, a part of that team. How were you able to maintain that? Why, why were you able to decide to be positive, even though it wasn't the ideal situation for you? So I am a super reflective person, um, especially in the moment. Like now I can sit there and say like, no, I should have been playing in my opinion. But in the moment, I always was like, there is something I could be doing better that's causing me not to play, which made me work out more, which made me get up shots more, which made me do all these extra things more. So then when I wasn't playing, it was like, all right, no, I still need to get better. I'm just going to be a good teammate for these guys. And then, you know, like, it's weird. You, you build such a bond with your teammates over the course of a year that you don't really have any envy for them. Like, I, I genuinely love everyone on that roster. Like, I, I've come to appreciate every single one of them. So from that standpoint, it was really easy to cheer on a guy that you really like being around and you like to see, you know what I'm saying? And I just know, like, if... If I was doing well and there was a kid pouting at the end of the bench, I would come out of the game and be like, like are you serious? You know, you can't get out of yourself, you know? So it was really easy for me to not think about myself. It comes very close. You put your name in the portal. We know you end up at GW. What went into that decision? Why did you decide the portal is the best option you want to transfer out? And also, GW is where you're going, but was there another school you're heavily looking at or you're heavily interested in? Yeah, there's like a list. And like, a couple of hours, I think like 10 schools hit me. And then within like a couple of days, it was like almost 30 schools. And I was like, wow, this is a lot. And one thing I didn't want to do that I did last time is like overthink anything. You know what I'm saying? So GW was a good fit. And they answered a lot of the questions I had that other schools couldn't answer per se. Um, so I didn't waste any time shooting GW. I, I do have a list of schools on my phone. Um that I kind of went over with my high school coach, my AU coach, my trainer, and actually the coaches at Tech, they are were super supportive of helping me to find like a, a new spot because they understood exactly where I was coming from when I had an end of the year meeting with them. You know, like my decision to leave was a lot loosely based off of the conversation I had with the coaches at the end of the year. That's something that's pretty key because we know with a lot of programs, they probably wouldn't always be supportive of a guy transferring and leaving them. How big was it for you to kind of have the coaches still support you in that way? And what kind of went down in the meeting? Like, what were they discussing with you? And how did you kind of decide, okay, this is where I want to move and how they end up helping you out? Um, so I told them, like, um, realistically, I, I, I don't want to play eight to nine minutes a game and then have some games where I, I don't even know if I'm getting in or not. Um, and – he was just explaining how, like, some of the guys there who play in front of me at my position, they're going to continue to play. And rightfully so. They, they've they been playing well all year. And um, I, I know if I was a junior in college, right, and a freshman comes in and I had a good year last year and I'm doing well this year, unfortunately, there's nothing that freshman can do to take my spot. But unfortunately, like, right now, I'm the freshman. So I think realistically, knowing I wasn't, going to play that much until I was a junior was not something I wanted to do. Um, at the end of the day, like, I don't put in all this work and do all the things I'm doing to, I don't want to say be a role guy, but to not, you know, get the chance to show that, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't necessarily care if I am a role guy, but I don't want to be in a position where I go with, for not playing eight games in a row. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's not something I enjoy. Did you choose GW? And we discussed Coach Christian a little bit in the beginning, but we know how special a coach he is going to be. We know this past year they got really had to deal with a lot of the pandemic. That really affected them a ton this year, so we weren't really able to see what this team could have been. But overall, your conversation with Coach Christian, you've talked about how special he is. But go a little bit deeper in that. Like, what is Coach Christian like on and off the court? Just what's his personality like? He's a very vibrant dude. He might have some of the most energy you've ever seen. Um, and I think he's a good coach. When he was at Mount St. Mary's, he won. When he was at Siena, he won. And I think genuinely he wants to take GW 
as far as possible. And right now, you know, we got Ira Lee, dude named Adam something. I forget his name. He's from uh, UConn. Uh, me from Tech. James Bishop already there. LSU. And this other guy from Maryland who also came last year. We got five, four or five dudes who are power five talent all in the A-10. So I think with him having the ability to coach all those guys, you know, and at that spot, we'll be a really good team. I personally think you guys are setting yourself up to be easily a contender in the A-10, a team that could easily make a jump to the tournament the next year. Look at this roster up and down. You say James Bishop somewhere I'm very high. I think he's going to be a special point guard. You're going to add yourself in there. Braden's coming in from UConn. You know, Ira Lee coming from Arizona, who we knew formerly was a top 50 recruit for his whole Arizona career. I said a lot of the pieces yeah. on this team too, but how special can you guys be? What can this team get done A ten and but also just nationally? A lot. I think we can accomplish a lot. Like I think this team will be really good. And I think when we all get the chance to just be in the gym, it'll be perfect. Have you got to know any of these guys? Yeah, have you had a conversation with any of the transfers and anyone's on the roster right now? Nah, I have not. I've texted James a couple of times, but that's it. I have not met anyone formally. When do you kind of plan to get on campus? Is there a time you set up for that? Or when do you kind of plan to get to with the team and start working this thing out? I think June. I'll be there in June. No doubt. Well, come on with me before I let you go. Why don't we just discuss something you have on your Twitter and Instagram? You have fine silence. What does that mean to you? <laughs> oh, the fine silence is because I meditate. So I think it's really important that at all times, no matter how much thing, how whatever what's going on around you or whatever what's going on in life, like mm – -hmm. It's there's always time for peace and tranquility, and I don't think we should ever get away from that. Can I agree more, man? Well, as you know, I was like wrapping up discussing your legacy, and we now know your next chapter is at GW. So, what do you want your legacy to be there? For? By the time you walk away from this career, what do you want to be remembered for for what you achieve, both on and off the court, out there in DC? Yeah, I, I have no idea to be honest. I I, I am such an unfuturistic futuristic thinker. <laughs> um, I hope off the court, I am. Like, no matter who I meet, whether it's, I don't know, like a random kid in one of my classes or like a, a six-year-old at Chipotle, I hope I can, you know, somehow impact people positively. Like, oh, someone smiled at me today and they don't even know who I am. Um, but that goes for everywhere, not just DW, just in general. Basketball-wise, um, I have no clue. I don't <laughs> – I set goals, but they're more daily goals. I have no, like – long-term goals so unfortunately i can't answer your question in the way you're thinking probably my final thing for you then what's the three biggest goals you have set for gw biggest goal number one is to bring a culture to practice every day that'll make us better goal number two would be to individually work on my game every single day and goal number three would be to um, have one interesting conversation a day with one of my teammates. That's awesome, Mill. Congratulations once again on the transfer and appreciate you taking time to come on today and look forward to seeing what I got next for you, man. Thank you, bro. I appreciate you. Of course, you're welcome on, man. God bless. You too, man.